Now we're going to talk about the introduction to type 1 diabetes, rationale for treatment, pathophysiology, as well as family dynamics. Let's do an outline of what we're going to be talking about today. So we're going to start off with an introduction. We're going to talk about what went wrong, or as I say in the field, pathophysiology. We're going to talk about um, how to fix it, not how to make a cure, because there is not a cure yet, but how to fix in terms of what it takes to manage it. And um, we'll also talk about why it's important to manage type 1 diabetes. And we'll also talk about family dynamics. And the reason we're putting that in here with all this medical stuff is that it's important for you to know that even though that is usually the sort of soft and fuzzy stuff, it absolutely informs how we do the rest of the things. So we'll talk a little bit about family roles, um, coping and living with it, and sort of everybody sort of checking in. Um, each family does it differently, so we're okay with that, but what we're talking about is that on some level, we talk about family member roles and expectations and fears and concerns. Cool. Next, we'll talk about hypo and hyperglycemia. And we'll just go through the causes, symptoms, and treatment. And after hypo and hyperglycemia, we'll talk about adjusting insulin doses. Now, this has a few stages to it because there's a lot involved in adjusting insulin doses. So we'll be talking about calculating insulin to carb ratios. We'll be talking about calculating insulin sensitivity factors. And we'll be talking about then putting it all together. That'll take some time, but we're going to do it. And you'll see that all of this stuff is way easier than you think. And just want to let you know that we're not going to be talking so much specifically about your child's diabetes or your diabetes, but what we will be talking about is the general guiding principles about how to sort of do it once you're given the information and how your doctors, your diabetes doctor and your diabetes nurse think about this when you call them in with information like blood sugar results or what's going on, all right? You need to check with your doctor and your diabetes educator about whether or not they want you doing this stuff. But what we're hoping is, is that, and what we think, um, what I think is that you'll be able to take this stuff and if you were stuck on a desert island and you had no cell phone, but you had all of the information and the material that you needed, if you had this information with you that we're gonna be talking about today, you would be able to manage, managing your diabetes um, even though you wouldn't be able to contact your team. The goal is to make you as independent as possible. So after we talk about adjusting insulin doses, we will talk about carb counting. It's important. And meal planning. It's way easier than it used to be in the past because we're not using exchange diets. Things are much more flexible, thank God. And um, we'll talk about all of that stuff. And then last but not least, we'll talk about sick days and sick day rules. Now, when you get sick or when you get ill, um, having diabetes doesn't mean you will get sick more often than anybody else. But what it does mean is that when you do get sick, it's going to throw your diabetes out of whack. We'll go more into the details on that. And we will also talk about in addition to managing sick day rules, we'll also talk about another emergency procedure, which is the use of glucagon. Glucagon is another hormone that's really responsible for helping insulin to uh, maintain blood sugar balance in your body. And that we don't have any beta cells um, and we don't have any insulin producing cells if you have diabetes, the glucagon producing cells are a little sort of slow in their response. So sometimes it's important if we're having a bad low blood sugar to take glucagon. So we'll be talking about that as well. All right. So let's talk about introducing ourselves to the main topic, which is 
what went wrong? Now, I like talking about this stuff because even though I've gone over it a thousand times, um, it always becomes clear to me and it makes me understand much better why I'm doing the things that I do living with diabetes on a daily basis. If everything's right and you don't have diabetes, insulin is a hormone that is responsible for taking glucose, which is the body's primary source of fuel, and bringing that into the cells. Insulin's really important. It also helps you metabolize protein. It's responsible for growth as well as carbohydrate metabolism. It's a very, very, very important um, hormone. And what happens in diabetes is that, for some reason, why we don't, we're not quite sure about as yet, the body in people with type 1 diabetes, the body perceives its insulin-producing cells, which are the beta cells, as foreign tissue. It attacks them and destroys them um, a lot at first, and then gradually over time it sort of finishes off the rest of what we had. And what ends up happening is that Remember I said that insulin is a hormone that brings glucose into the cells. Cells need glucose as their primary source of fuel. If we don't have any insulin, what happens is that the glucose doesn't get into the cells. And it starts building up in your blood sugar. And that's why when you're first diagnosed, your blood sugars are really high. If you're working with millimoles, then sometimes your blood sugar could be as high as 16 milligrams per deciliter. Your blood sugar could be as high as 300 and higher. It's not unusual for that to happen. What you need to know is, is that that is temporary. But until you get to the doctor's office or until you're sort of getting insulin back on board, the cells are saying, hey, we're starving. We're starving. Take care of us. So they send a message to the brain. The brain says, do not worry. We have some alternative source of fuel here. We'll be able to break down your fat, which is good if you were on a diet, but you're not. That's the problem. Now, when you break down fat, one of the byproducts of that fat breakdown is the production of ketones. Ketones can be used as an alternative source of fuel for the cells, and you don't need insulin to bring it into the cell. Well, you say, well, that's great. It's not great because what ends up happening is that over time, your body with no insulin, cell starving, keeps on breaking down fat, more production of ketones. These ketones are acidic. And if we don't stop this procedure or this process, what ends up happening is that you can go into what's called diabetic ketoacidosis or D. KA. That is a situation where you have no insulin at all, you're not getting any insulin replaced, and what ends up happening is that you can pass away from that, you can die as a result of not being treated. So, what we want to do here, the first thing that you get when you come into the hospital is you get a combination of insulin, because we want to bring that back, that'll help everything sort of get corrected, as well as some electrolytes. Now your doctors and nurses know how much you need of that stuff. That's not something that should be happening all the time. But this is basically what happens when you first get diagnosed. Your body stops making insulin because the cells are attacked and destroyed. The glucose starts building up in your blood. The cells feel like they're starving. They send a message to the brain and say, please give us some fuel. The brain says, no problem, we can break down some fat, you produce ketones, ketones are produced, and in the short term that works, but long term, as we said, it doesn't, because those ketones are very acidic, and we can't have too much acid, we can't have the bo our body fluids be too acidic, because it's not compatible with life. If left untreated, we can develop diabetic ketoacidosis, you probably are in a mild state of it when you first check into the hospital, and what ends up happening is that the way it gets corrected is by getting some IVs and getting some insulin on board, some fluids and electrolytes, and you're feeling better. That's basically what's going on. Okay. 
Now, let's look at that one more time. Insulin plus glucose goes into the cells. Great. Say, well, you know, when I was in the hospital, I got IVs, and then they told me that I would have to take shots. Why not just take a pill for the insulin to help? Well, the bottom line is, is that insulin is a hormone, and if you swallow it, it gets digested like any kind of protein, like it's a meat. So what ends up happening is that the only way that we can administer insulin once we get type 1 diabetes is by either an IV or by injections. Um, the injections are, uh, they're not, the needles aren't that big, but they can be scary at first, but that's how we get the insulin on board. Now, <clears throat> if what just broke down was an insulin factory, it would not be very hard to manage diabetes. But that's not what's broken down. What's broken down is a very complex system. Those beta cells are way more sophisticated than you would think. All right? These beta cells, the cells that produce insulin, they not only produce insulin, they also sense blood sugar levels. They can tell how much sugar is in your blood. They not only sense it, but they also, after they get that information, analyze it and determine whether or not you need some insulin or maybe glucagon. And then what they do is they deliver that insulin. Now, in terms of seamlessness and that system working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, that is absolutely miraculous. For those of us who have type 1 diabetes, this is a thing that's broken down. This is what we now have to be. We have to be the sensor. We have to be the analyzer. And we have to be the deliverer. We have to take over the role of those beta cells. So a lot of times when we're talking about sort of managing type 1 diabetes, People talk to us as sort of like we are an artificial pancreas in the kind of way that we have to think like a pancreas, in the kind of way that says that, you know, all of these roles, the sensing of where blood sugars are, the analyzing of how much we need, and the delivery in order to cover that stuff, um, is what we, is, that's our role. Therein lies the rub, because this takes a lot of work. And it's uh, exhausting from time to time. So let's talk a little bit about that, the exhausting part. And just sort of, now that we have an idea about what we'll need to do, let's talk about maybe, um, let's talk about what things are going to look like in the future, um, in your future, as we're managing diabetes. So the most important thing to do to, and to realize is, is that having diabetes shouldn't stop you from doing anything. Meaning that if you want to climb Mount Everest, you can. You just have to take your blood sugar meter and your insulin and your carbs with you. All right. If you want to be a Supreme Court justice, you can be one. You just have to sort of know how to manage it. What I'm saying is, is that really there are only three things you can't do. The rest is open. The three things that you can't do, you can't be an interstate or interprovincial truck driver if you're taking insulin. You can't be a commercial pilot, an airline, you can't be a commercial airline pilot. Although in Canada, if you were a pilot and you developed type 1 after being a pilot already, Air Canada, um, the um, Canadian Aviation Association will allow you to continue to fly, which I think is great and which makes me think that maybe at some point I'd like to move to Canada. So the one thing you can't do is be an interstate, interprovincial truck driver. You can drive around in the state, around and around and around, or the province, around and around and around, but you can't drive inter, all right? You can't be a commercial airline pilot and you cannot join the armed forces. As yet, I will tell you that over time, 
some of these things are sort of being addressed by um, our politicians and lawmakers, and there's a chance that some of these areas might open up down the road. But for the moment, the things that we can't do are these three things. Other than that, everything else is open. The other thing that's important to know is that you never have to go to the hospital again. You never have to go. You never have to be in the hospital again. That's important to know because I think some people, when they first get diagnosed, think that they'll have to be back in the hospital again and again and again. One of the things about type 1 diabetes that makes it different than a lot of other diseases is that we, meaning me and my family, are responsible for most of the care. While you're in the hospital or in the doctor's office, you're going to learn, you probably have learned this already, about how to manage your diabetes. You don't have to do it all alone, but you can be independent about it. And you can adjust your own insulin doses. And you can learn how to count carbs so that you can do whatever you want to do. More than any other disease, diabetes is one of those diseases where the patient and the family are most responsible for doing most of the care. Your diabetes care team is there to support you in order to do your best in that management. And as I said, we're going to talk about managing it today, sort of from soup to nuts, and how to do it. Cool. The other thing that you need to know is if you're a kid and you got diagnosed with diabetes, is that the better care you take of yourself, the less chance you have of developing complications. So, better care, less chance of complications. Of problems. Probably go on the web and you'll see that diabetes is a leading cause of new blindness or that um, diabetes causes amputations and that kind of stuff. And what you want to be careful about is understanding who that's talking about. It's usually talking about people that don't have access to great care and they can't take care of themselves well, or for people who have access but are just not being responsible about their management. I can't promise you that you'll never have a problem with your diabetes or a diabetes-related complication. But I can promise you that the better care you take of yourself, the less chance you have of developing problems. Now, I would like to be able to say that if you do A, B, C, and D all the time, that you'll never have to worry about it. But the bottom line is I'd be lying. What we really sort of have to get as a sort of fundamental understanding about living with this thing is putting the fear of that somewhere and moving on with our lives on a daily basis. So I just want you to know, parents, that your kids can walk around barefoot if they want. They, can, uh, they don't have to do special foot care. You'll read a lot about diabetes and foot care. It's important that we take care of every part of our body. But the foot care is usually mostly for people who have type 2 diabetes, not taking care of themselves, you know, that kind of stuff, right? And you can get into feet problem. But if you have type 1 and you're taking care and you're okay in general, then what we're saying is, is that you'll heal as well as anybody else. Want to make sure that you know this, and this is worth repeating several times, you know, until we're sick and tired of hearing it. You will heal as well as anybody else who doesn't have diabetes as long as you take care of it. Meaning that you're not going to get more sick or more, um, you won't have to be ever be back in the hospital again for your type 1 diabetes. Sometimes you just have to because you get cold or flu or a sick or a bug or something like that and you just sort of lose it and you need to go back. But bottom line is that myself, I've never been back. A lot of my friends who have type 1 diabetes have never been back. Um, so you will never have to go back to the hospital, or you might go back once or twice in um, sort of a, a extenuating circumstances, and you will heal as well as anybody else. Meaning, if you get a cut or a bruise, or if your 
little brother or your older brother wants to punch you in the nose and your parents say, no, he won't heal from the broken nose, you know, not at all. If you have type 1 diabetes and you get a broken bone or a broken nose because you were in a fight or something like that, you should continue to get in as many fights as you want and you'll be fine. What I'm saying is, is that diabetes, as we were talking about before, shouldn't stop you from doing anything, all right? And if you get into a scrape and you unfortunately break a bone or something like that, you will heal as well as anybody else. The key to staying fit on all levels and being able to keep your immune system working well is you really have to take care of yourself, all right? That is the bottom line. And that's why we're producing this today and presenting. That's why I'm presenting this to you today to give you the tools that you need to do to be able to do it. If you were a family of, you worked in a carnival and your family were, as they did for their work, they were uh, walking on glass to show people that they could do it. You're thinking, now that I have diabetes, I can't do that. Rubbish. You can do it as long as you're taking care of yourself. All right? Bottom line is, is um, that's the bottom line. The better care you take care of yourself, the less chance you have of developing complications and problems. Now, a lot of people have misconceptions about diabetes. And they think, well, you know, you can't eat this or you can't eat that. That's also a little bit of rubbish. We're going to talk about how you can eat whatever you want if your parents allow you to and based on your family values about nutrition. But eating, playing, sports, work, careers, all of this stuff is open to you, as open to it, except for those three things that I mentioned, as it was before you got diabetes. Okay, let's talk a little bit now about the initial symptoms. So remember we talked about insulin takes glucose into the cells. If you don't have insulin, you start breaking down fat. That gets dangerous because of the ketones. We want to stop that. Now, remember the first symptoms that you had? I want to explain those to you so that you have an idea about how they came about and why they stopped. The first symptom was loss of weight. I think you probably noticed that. That's because of the fat breakdown, right? So we got that one sort of taken care of, right? Then there was excessive urination and extreme thirst. What was that about? Well, here's what that's about. Here's what that is about. There's a thing called the renal threshold. You don't have to remember this, but for now, it's good to know. It's the blood sugar number over which sugar starts spilling from the blood into the urine. Now, this is the way that the body sort of keeps the plumbing clean. Remember, we said that with no insulin, your blood sugar starts rising to dangerous levels. And what the body is trying to do is dump that extra sugar and the way it dumps it is through the kidneys and through urinating. Well, as those big sugar molecules go through the kidney, they draw water from the rest of the body. Your bladder fills, you pee, but you're still thirsty because no insulin. And this thing keeps on going, peeing and thirsty, peeing and thirsty, peeing and thirsty. The only way that it stops is when you get to the hospital, or when you get to your doctor's office and we start giving you insulin. That is the magic fix for this whole thing. Now, once we have insulin on board, really important to know how much to give. But before we talk about that, because your doctors in the hospital will try and get an idea about how much insulin you need, right? But let's Look at how insulin works if you don't have diabetes, all right? If you have 42 pancakes for breakfast in the morning and you don't have diabetes, your body makes just the right amount of insulin to cover those 42 pancakes. And over time, if you're not eating anything at all throughout the rest of the day, until 10 p.m., you have a little saltine cracker 
your body makes just the right amount of insulin to cover that, and that's it. The picture here with no diabetes is when you need insulin, your body makes it, and it makes a lot if you need a lot. When you need insulin but you only need a little, your body makes a little, and it's just the right amount. And your blood sugar never goes, never drops between 60 to 120 milligrams per deciliter if you're in the United States or if you're in Europe and Canada. It really never goes out of range. This is the range without having diabetes. You can do whatever you want and your body will make sure that your blood sugar stays in this range. All right? Now, the way it does that is like this. Remember, here's a little beta cell. It makes insulin. And right next to the beta cell are alpha cells. They make glucagon. These two cells produce, a hormones, produce the hormones that regulate blood sugars. Insulin makes your blood sugar come down. Glucagon makes your blood sugar go up. And between these two hormones, your blood sugar stays within this range most of the time. Magic. What's even more magical is that they don't even have to, you don't even have to think about it. This happens on a microsecond to microsecond um, basis, and it happens 24 hours a day, seven days a week. As a matter of fact, it never stops. That is what's really magical. Now, if you have diabetes, what ends up happening is that if you have the same day, we have to figure out exactly how to match what the body does, or not exactly, but do it as best as possible. If we have those pancakes, we need to figure out how much insulin to give. And we have to give it by injection, because that's the only way that it's going to get in. And if we're not eating anything all day, remember, the body's always making a little bit of insulin, so we need to have some insulin on board as well. And we need to be able to figure out how much insulin to take whenever we need it. So usually most people eat three times a day. They have snacks here and there. What we're talking about is having diabetes means that we have to try and mimic what the body does when we don't have diabetes. That is the big job. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit about now in terms of how we do that. And as part of this thing about what we need to do to effectively manage diabetes and take up slack where the beta cells have left off because they're not around anymore is basically keeping things in balance. And what do I mean by that? What we have to learn, and what we'll do throughout the course of these sessions, is learn what things make blood sugars go up, and learn what things make blood sugars go down, and trying to keep a balance as best as possible to reach those target numbers that we were talking about. So things that make your blood sugar go up are food, illness, emotions, you really get angry, um, not enough insulin. Things basically that make your blood sugar go down are the opposite. Insulin, exercise, um, not enough food. And this is what we need to learn how to do, is how to sort of take into consideration those variables, check our blood sugars at critical times during the day, more often at first, and getting a sense of how much insulin we need to take. It's all based on this kind of stuff. It's pretty simple, and that's what we're trying to show you, is that there are some pretty simple guiding principles that underlie and inform all of what we do around diabetes management. Cool.
But first, a few principles in terms of just general understanding. How much insulin do I need? Well, usually it's about 0 0.5 to 0 0.7 units per kilogram of body weight. So, if I weigh 90 kilograms, that's a big guy, but that's me, then what I'm going to need to do is the doctors are going to say as a starting dose, just to get a ballpark estimate of where we are and how much we need, just a place to get started, right? It would be 90 times 0 0.6 equals 54 units. And the doctors would say, all right, Joe needs 54 units. But you know what? Joe doesn't need all those 54 units all at one time. This is what he needs in 24 hours. So what we're going to do is take those 54 units, divide them in half. Why? Because Joe needs half of his amount just to keep him going all day. So 2 into 54, exactly 27. So 27 units will be given for my background or basal dosing, meaning that's how much insulin I need to keep me going without even doing anything or without even eating anything. It's just the amount of insulin that I need, sort of approximately, to keep me in my target zone, you know, which is 70 to 150 or 4 to 8. All right? If I don't eat or don't do anything, this background amount of insulin should keep me in that target range for my blood sugars. Now, the other 27 units that I have are 27 units to play with for my meals and snacks. So once we get started, when we get started with diabetes management, we're thinking about at least three meals a day and some snacks here and there. And that would mean that if we take 27 and let's say divide it by five, all right, is about five. What it's saying is, is that we can give Joe five units at every meal. That'll cover him. And he'll have some extra units available for snacks and that kind of stuff. At the end of the day, the 54 units is what I'm going to use to keep me going on a daily basis. Now, that usually ends up being something of a range. So, for instance, I usually use anywhere between 40 to 60 units per day. And I know that from doing a lot of work and a lot of blood sugars and a lot of stuff like that. You'll know that too. So the 54 units, as I said, is just a place to start. That's how we sort of parcel it out. And that should take out some of the mystery as to why you, and how the doctors and the nurses figure out about how much insulin to get started with. We need, just to go over that, we need a basal rate of insulin, meaning 24-hour background amount, and we need something for boluses, or for a quick shot for covering food or correcting. It's a quick shot of insulin. And we need that, as I said, for covering food and for quick shots. 50% of your total daily dose is approximately assigned to the basal or the background. And the other 50% you have to play with for your boluses to cover food and making corrections and that kind of stuff. That's what we do with the 54 units. The 54 units is just an approximation and based on that approximation we do a lot of blood sugar checks and sort of testing and checking and that kind of stuff to make sure about exactly how much we need. Now, your dose will probably not be that much unless you're a teenager your dose might be 
30 units per day with 15 as your basal background and 15 available for boluses. Your friend's dose might be 40 units per day. Why am I saying this? Because you need to know that there's not one ideal dose. The ideal dose for you is the amount of insulin you need to keep your blood sugar within this range about 80% of the time. That's your ideal dose. And an ideal dose for me is not the same as my ideal as the ideal dose for my friend Paul or Johnny. We each have different doses that based on our checking our blood sugars and calculating how many carbs we're eating, we figure out how much we need to get here. It's a lot of work, but it's important to know, especially if you're growing from like you're a 10 year old and you're becoming a teenager, there's no ceiling for what's a good dose or how much you're allowed to take. The amount of insulin that you need, the amount of insulin that you need is the amount of insulin that gets you to this range most of the time. Now, if you are an infant, toddler, to about five or six years old, we don't want you in this range as tightly as we do if you're an older kid. What we want to do is strike some compromise between as good control as possible, optimal control, and not too many lows. So, for infant toddlers to five or six years old, we might be saying that, you know what, we're just looking to stay in that range about 70% of the time. The rest of the time, your numbers can be wherever they want to be. And we're not going to be too worried about that. When you get to the age of about seven years old, then we start tightening up the ship. And we start saying, you know what, seven-year-olds are much more able to be aware of when their blood sugars are going low. And so what we're going to do is try and get closer to that 80% in target range as we can. It's almost impossible to be 100% in target range. I don't know anybody in my circle of friends that's able to do it. The only people that are really able to do it are women with type 1 who get pregnant. Their blood sugars are totally in range when they wake up, fasting blood sugars, and post meals, they're totally in range, and usually their fasting blood sugars are 5.0 or, 5 or 90 or below, and their post meal blood sugars are usually 6.1 or 110 and below. That's very hard. And they do this 100% of the time if you're pregnant and you're type 1, which makes me want to get pregnant sometimes because that'll really push me to take care of myself. But that's not going to happen. And um, given that that's not going to happen, what I'm happy to do is try and be in my range 80% of the time. Or if you're a little bit younger, you know, to be 70% of the time. Um, or even 60% of the time within that range with the numbers flying around wherever they are the rest of the time. And then, like I said, a younger child's growth and development, neurologically speaking, is still being formed when they're younger, up until about the age of 10. So we're much more worried from, you know, um, up until the age of 10 about making sure that you don't have too many low blood sugars. So this is a compromise because the tighter care you take of yourself, the less complications you have down the road. But what we found over many years of um, managing children with diabetes and patients with diabetes is that we can strike a compromise and then if we tighten the ship up as we get older, looking to stay more and more within this zone of 80%, then we're able to minimize complications to a tremendous extent. And just to know, the Diabetes Complication and Control Trial has proven conclusively about 12 years ago that the better care you take, the less chance you have of complications. 
that's going to be a theme that runs throughout the entire presentation. It certainly informs my entire life as I manage it and live with it, you know? Um, and it's a constant balancing thing, which gets us to the next topic, and that is coping and dealing with feelings and family dynamics. Remember we said 80%? trying for target zone, that's a lot of work. And now that we have to do what the body has done automatically for years before we had diabetes, here's what we have to do on a daily basis. We have to take our injections or put our infusion sets in, if you're on a pump. We have to check our blood sugar, and we have to check our blood sugar one, two, three, four, at least four times a day. I usually check my blood sugar about 10 to 15 times a day, as do most of my friends who are taking care of themselves. We have to count the carbs, how much carbohydrate we're eating to figure out how much insulin. And we have to write the numbers down or enter the data somewhere. This is even before finding out how much homework we have. That is a lot of extra work. I have a resentment against the United States government. I think they should give me $150,000 a year just to stay home and manage my diabetes. Now, it feels like a full-time job. So, of course you're going to feel things like angry, sad, sometimes lonely, frustrated when you do everything that you're supposed to do and the numbers don't come out to where they're supposed to be, and anything else that you might think about that comes along with doing a lot of extra work to take care of yourself. And the question is, what do we do with these feelings? Well, on some level, what we're talking about in diabetes, and sometimes it's more difficult for the parents than it is for the kids, because parents have a tendency when their child gets diagnosed to feel powerless. They were powerless over preventing it from happening, and they're powerless from fixing it. And that can make you very sad. These feelings come up again and again. It's not that they'll just come up once or twice and then you'll never have to deal with them. So the feeling of powerlessness for the parents and the feelings of frustration and anger and sadness about, oh, why do I have to do this? And sometimes feeling like you're the only one on the block who has to do this. Why me? You know, all of those things come up again and again and again over the course of time. And the idea here, in terms of when we talk about coping, is to try and connect with other people, with others. So support groups are really important. One of the best support groups that I know about is children with diabetes. They have these incredible conferences that to me are like the Woodstocks of diabetes. It's peace, love, and insulin for three or four days where all of us have diabetes, brothers and sisters and kids and parents and grandparents and all that kind of stuff. And they have what's called the Friends for Life conferences. And they have them in the United States and they also have them um, abroad as well. And these are the kinds of things that you want to get to as a family to help deal with the feelings that come up that are difficult to handle. What happens when you go to something like children with diabetes is that you realize you're not the only one. The other things that you can sort of feel that I feel when I go there and a lot of the kids that I work with feel is that they start not feeling so sad, but they get a little happy seeing others who have it, and watching others taking care of themselves. Their anger goes away. 
and they become less angry. They don't feel so lonely. They see others. And it's easier to take some of the frustrations that come along with managing your diabetes when you find out that others are going through the same thing. It's a funny thing about human nature, but if we're the only ones experiencing something, we feel like it's not fair. When we meet others, like you can, like about 3,300 others at the big Friends for Life conference in Orlando, you realize that you're not the only one and you can put it in perspective and sort of get on with your life. For parents, the Children with Diabetes conference is so healing. Parents see other parents struggling. When you're watching other people struggle, it makes your struggle feel more validated and it also makes you feel much better about having to do it and sort of recharges your battery. Almost everybody that I speak to when they go to Children with Diabetes is they feel like from the love and the friendships and the knowledge because they have a lot of presentations from worldwide experts on diabetes, their batteries get full and recharged and they can go home again and sort of do what they need to do in order to take care of their diabetes, their child with diabetes. Now, the nice thing about this also is that there's a program for brothers and sisters because that is so important. Sometimes, or a lot of times, what ends up happening is that as parents have to deal with their feelings and have to take care of the child with diabetes, sometimes brothers and sisters get left out. And what's really nice about the Children with Diabetes Conference and a lot of other conferences like them is that there are special programs for brothers and sisters. And there are even sessions where the brothers and sisters can complain about how much they hate having diabetes. The same for the kids with diabetes. Talking about it, getting it out, not having to keep it in. Sort of cleans things up, it recharges your battery, and it allows you to sort of move on to where you're going with your life. So I highly recommend that. Now, a little bit more about family dynamics. It's really important to sort of take that into consideration and spend some time thinking about that and at least openly talking about it. What they have found that love, respect, and support within a family equals better management and better control. Why? Well, I think it makes sense. If you're feeling loved and respected and you're feeling supported in doing what you need to do, then what ends up happening is that it's easier to do what you need to do. And diabetes is a kind of disease that if you don't have your act together as a family, it can really make things difficult. So, there's so much work involved in managing diabetes that what you want to do when you first get diagnosed is make sure that first diagnosis, you want to make sure that everybody is a part of the education. Meaning when you learn how to take care of yourself when you're in the hospital for the first time, you want to make sure that brothers and sisters and grandmas and grandpas and nannies and babysitters, whoever you want to be a part of your diabetes team needs to be there. And you are the captains of your ship when it comes to that. If your hospital or educator hasn't invited you to invite your diabetes team, ask them if it's okay that you'd like everybody to be on the same frequency and wavelengths in terms of what constitutes good care and what constitutes um, management and appropriate management. So everybody needs to be educated. Your feelings need to be addressed and you have a right to that. That is not like an extra cherry on the top of the Sunday as a sort of extra nice thing. Your feelings are so important here when you get diagnosed at the beginning. And it's your diabetes healthcare team that's responsible for helping you deal with that stuff. So everybody should be included and a part of the education. They don't have to come 
to every single session or every single clinic visit for the rest of your life, which for most kids will be one clinic visit. And the reason for that is that we want to make sure that kids are growing and developing appropriately, that insulin doses are matching growth and development, and the ongoing management is smooth. Not everybody has to come to every clinic visit all the time, but at least at the beginning, everybody should be included so that their questions are addressed, so that their feelings are addressed, and so that everybody can check in. And the last thing I think that's important when we're talking about this, just as a sort of framework, is that you guys need to decide what your roles are as far as diabetes and family goes. And what you need to remember is that it doesn't have to be split equally. It doesn't have to be um, where brothers and sisters do this and parents do this. You figure that out for yourselves about what makes most sense for you in terms of your family. But you need to have that discussion at some point. And it's best to have that discussion before you leave the hospital. Because when you get home, things are going to be a little hectic. You're going to be nervous. You're going to be like, you know. So you want to get some of this stuff taken care of before you go home, while you're in the hospital. And you want to make sure that your diabetes team is helping you to address some of these issues. This is not an unreasonable request on your part. The last thing I want to say about family dynamics is just to convey to you a little research project that they did at Children's Hospital in Philadelphia about 30 years ago. Because this sets the tone and sort of qualifies and informs everything that I was talking about a minute ago. They looked at 50 families at the time of diagnosis. They wanted to see what things could a clinician look at and say, based on this, we think the child will be in optimal control or less than optimal control one to one and a half years after diagnosis. So essentially what we're saying is that the research project was trying to identify some variables that would give a healthcare professional, a diabetes professional, healthcare professional, a sense about looking at this one thing, we can predict how this kid's gonna do metabolically and how their hemoglobin A1C will look. Now, what do you think that variable was? Well, what they found out in that study at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia about 30 years ago, when they were looking at 50 families at the time of diagnosis, about what thing was the one thing that could give a clinician a predictive tool to say, based on this, a child's control will be that. Fairly significantly was the fact that um, the mother's subjective sense of how supported she felt by the other family members was most predictive of what a child's hemoglobin A1C, which is a marker of diabetes control, would be a year to a year and a half down the road. The other thing that they found that was most um, correlated to a child's control was ability for the family to organize itself around the diagnosis and suit up and show up as a family for initial education about how to manage diabetes. These two things, the mother's subjective sense of how supported and family's ability to suit up and show up for that three or four days of getting education and learning how to do it was the most important thing and was most statistically related to a child's hemoglobin A1C or diabetes control a year afterwards. That's important. And that's why we're 
putting it up front here at the beginning of the sessions because we want you to know that taking this throughout the rest of the information that we're presenting to you today, it's really important that all of you be engaged in a three-dimensional kind of vital way and that people in your family um, shouldn't be left on the wayside, um, that everybody needs to be included in some way so that they feel a part of this. Even if they are told that you don't have any responsibility to do anything, at least that those roles are clarified. Cool. So that's it for today in terms of the introduction about uh, to diabetes. The next time we'll be talking will be about talking about hypoglycemia, hyperglycemia, causes symptoms and treatment. Hypo and hyper just means low and high blood sugars, and we're going to be talking about what to do about that.